Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles, and despite what people say in the chat, I am not the Lauren Hill of the left. And we are on time. You guys are just early. Thank you for joining us. If you are new to the program, please hit like. Please hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell as we are constantly adding new programming to the show all the time. If you have the means and you feel so inclined, please become a patron where we do things like we have the champagne room, which is usually after these shows, we go to uh, a special, special place where we have a more, it's just more fun in the champagne room. And we're bringing back movie night. This month, we will be watching a movie with all of our patrons, so we're excited about that. That being said, let me bring in my homie, my co-host, my dog. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. It's funny when people make these jokes about us being late because there's, if they could see me running around beforehand, they would totally understand the, the, the nervous uh, energy that goes on. I'm always frightened that someone's not going to show up. We both kind of have it. You're just a little more chill about it than I am. Just because I know we can have a great show. This is two of us. It's true. I just always get like we had a few. Were you on the show where the guy didn't show up? Were you on that one? I was on that show and he rescheduled. Jack Rasmus did that to us once. He did do that too. <laughs> Old white guys. <laughs> I know, right? We can't. We we shan't have old white guys. Well, our guest is he here? Is he in the room? Oh, he's in. He's in the virtual green room. I know he had a few errands to run. Life always calls we made an intro video for this guest we are doing intro videos on tuesday now before the tuesday show because there's no reason to do an intro video for thursday that's true but check this out get ready for what we're going to talk about and i'm sure the first image is going to piss off quite a few people It is Ronald Reagan in 1964. Meanwhile, back in the city, under urban renewal, the assault on freedom carries on. Private property rights so diluted that public interest is almost anything a few government planners decide it should be. In a program that takes from the needy and gives to the greedy, we see such spectacles as in Cleveland, Ohio, a million and a half dollar building completed only three years ago must be destroyed to make way for what government officials call a more compatible use of the land. The president tells us he's now going to start building public housing units in the thousands where heretofore we've only built them in the hundreds. But FHA and the Veterans Administration tell us they have 120,000 housing units they've taken back through mortgage foreclosure. For three decades, we've sought to solve the problems of unemployment through government planning. And the more the plans fail, the more the planners plan. The latest is the Area Redevelopment Agency. They've just declared Rice County, Kansas, a depressed area. Rice County, Kansas has 200 oil wells, and the 14,000 people there have over $30 million on deposit in personal savings in their banks. January 6, 2021, was for some a watershed moment for the rise of the reactionary right. With the rolling back of voting rights, mainly for people of color, gerrymandering voting districts, and an assault on women's reproductive and trans rights, how does the GOP continue to wield so much power as a political minority? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution. I don't know just why they wanted to call this a confession. I... 
I certainly don't feel guilty about being a Republican. I've always been a Republican. My father is, his father was. The whole family is a Republican family. I voted for Dwight Eisenhower the first time I ever voted. I voted for Nixon the last time. But when we come to Senator Goldwater, now it seems to me we're up against a, a very different kind of a man. This man scares me. Now, maybe I'm wrong. A friend of mine has said to me, listen, just because uh, a man sounds a little irresponsible during a campaign doesn't mean he's going to act irresponsibly. You know that theory that the White House makes the man. I don't buy that. You know what I think makes a president? I mean, aside from his, his judgment, his experience, are the men behind him, his, 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 uh, his advisors, the cabinet. And so many men with strange ideas are, are working for Goldwater. You, you hear a lot about what these guys are against. They seem to be against just about everything. But what are they for? Thank you. All right. Uh, did you, was that your first time seeing that, Pascal? No, I saw I watched it earlier. Um, I love that clip at the end, that uh, LBJ ad campaign. I had seen that prior. I forgot the name of that actor. He lived a long time. I actually remember. I see, his name is Steve something. I, I, we'll see if our guest knows him because all white people know each other. The masses must either be able to locate themselves symbolically in the ruling class or be provided real opportunities to become faux aristocrats in the family, the factory and the field. The former path makes for an upside down populism in which the lowest of the low see themselves projected in the highest of the high. The latter makes for democratic feudalism in which the husband or supervisor or white man plays the part of Lord. This is a quote from our guest book, The Reactionary Mind. Corey Robin takes a deep dive into the modern conservative moment and why it can be so intoxicating. Rich or poor, you can be your own Olympus just by virtue of your American citizenship. So despite class inequities, the conservative can be elite just by nature of American exceptionalism. Corey Robin is a well-respected political scientist. He has written several books, most famously – where we got that quote from the reactionary mind, conservatism and Edmund Burke to, from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump and the enigma of Clarence Thomas, which we will talk about later. Corey has dedicated much scholarship to the nature of American political conservatism. His books trace the ideological groundings of American conservatism in the United States through though we have had several guests on our show that discuss the danger of the current reactionary right. Corey Robin offers a different thesis. Robin argues that. The right is not strong but weak and that their capacity to implement their agenda can be severely hampered over time. Please welcome coming all the way live from somewhere in New York City, Corey Robin. Welcome. I'm not used to this kind of fanfare. It's just a little bit... Uh outside my lane but thank you it's nice to be here does it make you feel like you're ready to do some like <laughs> no <maybe> not at <laughs> all <laughs> that's not how you walk into class what's that that's not how you walk into class no i i slink in very scared and hope i can get through the lecture <laughs> Corey, i'm actually very excited to have you because uh i have engaged your writing and your work Various times we've been connected on Facebook for almost a decade, mm -hmm. believe it or not, and you've seen my <clears throat> myriads of rantings, and I'm sure you probably wondered the hell is wrong with this guy several times. Um, one of the reasons why I'm glad you're here, I'm going to tell you what I'm disappointed in one way, and this is a disappointment. I know for a fact we're not going to have enough time for me to talk to you and us to talk to you about all the bases we want to cover. Because frankly, I think we could talk for hours about the political theory because you are a scholar of political theory and political thought. And uh, I'm fascinated by your work on the reactionary right. Some of your art theses I disagree with, but my only disappointment is that I wish we had 12 hours because I would love going back and forth with you on so many of these subject matters, uh, Professor Robin. But, I'm going to start off with a banger, and if you watch our show, you know that I usually kind of come with the hammer with the questions pretty early on. Yep. 
one of the themes we have on this show is the 50 plus year counter revolution. I think you're familiar with it. The premise of our theme is that basically from 1968 to the modern era, the bipartisan consensus of American politics has been a counter revolutionary reaction to the New Deal Civil Rights Coalition of the 1960s. My question to you is that first, as a expert and scholar on American political theory, thought, and political history, do you agree with our thesis? And number two, if you do, in light of that, how can you argue that the reactionary right has been weakening in the face of that trajectory? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me here. And as you said, we have been uh, um, Facebook friends for quite some time. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've always admired about your presence on social media uh, is that uh, you hold steady uh, and don't get, um, what's the word, flung around by whatever toy is in front of everybody's face. And I appreciate that. Um, I think that's a kind of a a virtue that's been really weakening, frankly, over the years. And to see somebody be on social media and yet remain committed to a certain point of view without flagging, I think is uh, something to be celebrated. So anyway, I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, so in answer to your two questions, the, the, the answer to the first is yes. Um, the, uh, the rise of the right has been a counter-revolutionary project um, the right has always been a counter-revolutionary force. I trace it in my book, Back to the French Revolution. That's where the modern right um, originates. And it originates as a counter-revolutionary project. Um, it goes through its ebbs and flows, its ups and downs. But every time that the right um, appears and, and, and gains power, it's always in response to uh, what I call an insurgent movement of emancipation from below. Um, and to that degree, the modern right, which I think you rightly trace back to, I would just say broadly the 1960s, um, has been a reaction against um, the transformative politics of the New Deal civil rights. And in fact, in that clip, the, the Reagan clip, clip that you showed um, just, just now, I was struck by something which is how seamlessly he um, moves back and forth between the New Deal and civil rights. Many people on the left, I think, recently have had a hard time putting those two things together. But mm. the, the, the right, I mean, the way he talks about planners um, and public Planning. housing yeah. projects and in the city and urban renewal, it's mm. these things. Um, and he's traced and, he, and the power of Reagan was that he traced it back to the New Deal. Um, it was it was partially a racial backlash of the 60s, but he put it in a much broader arc. Professor, and that was the power of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to, to interrupt. Do you feel that this is the rise of Goldwater is really what we see? Because, you know, Reagan gets a lot of the blame. I, I could have taken a clip from from Goldwater, but he doesn't have his own library like reagan does and so uh and you can only imagine what my social media looks like now because <laughs> i signed up for that but with with the rise of of goldwater during this presidential run um you don't really see the seeds of that until or maybe victory until reagan's uh presidential win in 80 right um so they do a, a masterful job at kind of hammering away and in your book uh you know, you definitely talk about um, the way they went at the new left in that time as well. Like, where yeah. do you put Goldwater in this? Is he the architect? I mean, I think there were multiple architects. I wouldn't say he's the art architect. And in fact, in many ways, you could trace it back to even earlier to the 1930s and what was called the, the, the conservative coalition, um, where you first begin to see this glimmer of this kind of defense of Jim Crow and assault upon the New Deal and the way they start, you know, coming together and you watch them doing these baby steps uh, in formation that are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but definitely Goldwater is the kind of big public coming out um, as the national candidate. And I think this actually gets to the second question that Pascal raised. If, if I see the right as a counter-revolutionary reactionary force 
in large part a reaction against the civil rights New Deal. Why do I think they are losing power? Um, and I think it's it, it actually gets to this to this whole Goldwater Reagan connection. I see. Um, well, let me step back for one second, um, and I tend to do that, so feel free to cut me off because I can go on way too long. Um, I think when people on the left in particular think about reaction, we think about it as an instantaneous force, right? There's a, a leftist insurgency, and then there's a backlash, and it just happens. And that's not the way it works. It takes the right a very long time to learn how to do battle successfully and beat the left. And if you were to ask a conservative in the 1960s, in the early 70s, are you guys winning? Are you going to win? It would have been an open question. They didn't feel like they were winning at all. And in many ways, they weren't. But it took a long ascendancy for them. And Reagan is really the culmination of it. Um, and when you think about what the right did and what its project was, first and foremost, to beat back the civil rights movement, to stop it. To, to, decel to stop it and then make it decelerate and then to start pushing back against the New Deal um, and the things that the right did to do that. That was a much, much bigger project, I think, than what the right has on, on offer today. Uh, and it required a much more transformative reversal of the commitments, the fundamental commitments of the state and the basic premises of society. With time, I think what happened was that the right got very successful, um, and it really and 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 the sign of its success, the biggest sign of the right's success was Bill Clinton. Um, it was the transformation of the Democratic Party, and I, I see you wanted to jump in. I just want to say a quick thing before, and I'll, I'll stop. Um, Margaret Thatcher has this. There's a very famous question that was put to her, which is, you know, what what is your basic biggest success? And you know, she was a formidable stateswoman. Yeah. And she said, Tony Blair. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that's not just being cute. What that is, is saying is that my project of hegemony, which began as this tiny outpost within one party, gained power within the party, gained power over the state, and then transformed my opposition such that the opposition yeah. had to speak my language in order to get a hearing. Bill Clinton was the, that was the final victory. I think since then, I think the right has had a tough time and you can see it in multiple ways. I'll stop there and we can talk more about how you see it. Yeah. But 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 I think that's that would be the arc of uh, the trajectory that I would trace. And then I think what has happened since then has been a decline in power. Jesse, indulge me. All right, Corey, this is this is where get the boxing gloves on. This is where we're going here. Do you see Corey, do you see his hands? I now, do. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm not blind. First of all, let me tell you right now. This is the first time Corey and I have actually engaged. I don't think you guys may know this. I really like Corey Rogan. I like him a lot because I'll be very frank. I'm going to say it. I'll be transparent. Corey Rogan is one of the few white academics I know who takes a black political thought seriously. I'll be very honest about that. There are books that I've suggested to people that he's read for his own books that I know other people don't read. And that's actually one of the reasons I actually enjoy engaging engaging with him, besides the myriad of other things. Here, let me get to the point, Corey. <laughs> I make the argument, and I think you may just, you may disagree with me, that civil rights was a bipartisan consens consensus as a reaction to the pending popularity of Soviet communism in the global South post-colonial independence. If it was a bipartisan consensus, then can we not argue that the right wing's aversion to it was an aberration from the bipartisan ruling class agenda and not a consistent agenda of the right? Number one, I would say that. And number two, if we realize that neoliberalism, the transformation of capitalism that takes us to the modern area, which I like to say is a fancy word for hyper privatization and marketization, was also a bipartisan consensus that starts with Jimmy Carter with the Volcker shock, then how can we truly say that this reactionary project is exclusively a right-wing project and not a bipartisan one? And even the liberal version of the civil rights was a liberal project and not a bipartisan one. And are you speaking more to the cultural aspect of the project? Because I feel like the cultural aspect definitely started to win over. 
more so than just the political. Is that to me or to Pascal or to, to, both? to, to both? Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like you to address the, the points because I hit you with some heavy, heavy stuff there, Corey. Yeah, there's a lot in what you said. And so uh, I'm going to try to break it apart. Um, the first thing I would say is, is that um, all conservatism, all right-wing thought is counter-revolutionary. OK, but not all counter revolutionary thought is conservative or right wing. And, and, that, and that is not meant to be a glib formula. It's really, really important because I feel sometimes we people blur these things together. There is no conservatism that's not counter revolutionary and reactionary. And we could talk more about what that means. But there are multiple kinds of counter revolution and reaction. Liberalism in France, for instance, in the early 19th century is born as a kind of counter revolutionary project in somewhat the way that you're talking about with civil rights and Soviet communism. Okay, so there is no doubt that uh, that racial progress in the United States on, on, on uh, African-American equality was perceived by elite political planners in the United States um, as something that was necessary for fighting the Cold War. I mean, this is well established in the scholarly record. You can see it in memos that Dean Acheson is, I mean, as early as the late 1940s, is submitting um, into the to the Truman administration, to briefs that are presented to the court, Supreme Court in Brown and so on. So the Democratic Party liberal elites are very concerned, very, very concerned. And it's arguably what helps push things over the edge in terms of civil rights. That's true. But also from the very beginning, there is a faction, um, and, and not just a faction, it's a pretty sizable chunk of, of both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party that is very resistant uh, to that. And they start fighting back right away. Um, and, and with more and more success over time. So for instance, the Nixon administration, um, I talk about this in a recent piece on the Voting Rights Act. Um, from the get-go, the, the Nixon administration is thinking there's a part of, I, I don't want to get too much into the technicalities, but the, one of the key parts of the Voting Rights Act is Section 5. And John Mitchell, who's the attorney general, not a kind of, you know, uh, figure way out there, but the attorney general of the United States is trying to gut Section 5 of, of the Voting Rights Act. That's a 40-year project that culminates in the Shelby decision in uh, 2013. So I, I, I think that sometimes the left makes the, the uh, mistake of thinking that kind of elite liberalism is not only just a bipartisan project, but is a sort of settled project. And I think it's not, um, is the truth of the matter. It always provokes um, its own reactions against it. And, and those influence both, you know, like I said, you know, very elite forms of the Republican Party. Um, and, and, and the civil rights movement, as much as it was kind of a consensus project, it creates dissensus uh, from the get go and, and spurs a lot of the things that we know about in terms of the Nixon administration and, and, and the Reagan administration. There's a second part of your question about neoliberalism and Jimmy Carter, which I'm happy to answer, but I, I didn't want, I don't want to go on too long. So uh, I, let me know if I should keep going. Or no, 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 you're on, a, you're on a roll. And I really want to see what you have to say about the uh, Volcker shock. Okay, so the, here we come to a, a sort of a different part of, of, of the argument, um, and, and it has much more to do with, less to do with reaction and conservatism than what are, you know, party regimes in America. Um, the United States has had four or five um, party presidential regimes. And when I say a regime, I mean a kind of a, a language of governing that, um, basically both parties kind of have to accept the rules of the game, essentially that both parties have to accept in order to play the game. So for instance, um, the New Deal is a perfect example. 1932 creates a whole language for how, you know, modern New Deal liberalism. And when Dwight D. Eisenhower is elected in 1952, a lot of people in the Republican party are hopeful that he's gonna roll back the New Deal. He's gonna, you know, he's gonna overthrow the New Deal and it's gonna be over. And instead, what he does is um, extend the New Deal. Uh, one of the key ways he does, in fact, is uh, with Social Security Act and African Americans, uh, African American workers in the South and domestic workers uh, being included in, into the Social Security Act. Um, these are things that conservatives are outraged by. Um, but 
you know, Eisenhower is a savvy politician and he knows, you know, I, I can't come in here and just undo this thing. It's not how things work. That's a regime. That's the power of a regime. But regimes come and go. They, 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 they rise and they fall. And at the end of a regime, you see presidents and, and, and the parties that are entrusted with caretaking the regime start scrambling things and trying to improvise and change um, in order to hold on to this, this regime that's falling apart. I mean, you see this, you know, for instance, I mean, you see this in France under the Ancien Regime, the old regime, uh, it tries to desperately reform itself as its power is just ebbing away. And in trying to reform itself, it ultimately collapses. I mean, this is the irony, I think, about these late regime presidents like Jimmy Carter, like Herbert Hoover. We remember them, you know, the, the, the left remembers Herbert Hoover as this arch reactionary. The truth is Hoover was a progressive reformer and was trying desperately to do certain things to alter the state's relationship with capitalism. Um, and from the other side, Jimmy Carter, the caretaker of the New Deal regime is desperately trying to change things in order to preserve the Democratic Party coalition in some way and some features of liberalism. And I so I see what Carter is doing there with the Volcker, uh, the, the, the appointment of Volcker as this late regime scrambling, trying to hold on, but sowing the seeds of its own collapse. Not unlike, again, just to jump across the Atlantic, what Louis the Sixteenth and and some of his ministers are doing on the eve of the French Revolution, um, or you know, uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll stop there. That's interesting what you have to say about Hoover. Um, I don't I don't know Pascal how into Hoover uh, you are or pre uh, New Deal presidents like him, but there were actually a lot of large projects that he did roll out. Um, Corey, I am from the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, Golden Gate Bridge <laughs> was a is, a is a Hoover project, uh, as well as I think there was some more with the dam, the Hoover the dam. dam. Is it yeah, another? I mean, he was a he was a big progressive administrator. And, I know that know. the first uh, Southern strategy was implemented by Hoover that cost him black votes. As a matter of fact, that there was. Oh, uh, I thought Hoover actually got more black votes. He did, but there's a beginning to be like a a, a loss of votes uh, for some. I forget there was some policy initiative that he had made a problem. Corey probably knows this better than I do, but there was some kind of policy that he was supposed to have promised to black voters that kind of start to purge him. Well, so, I mean, you know, the African American vote in the late 1920s. It's really fascinating. Uh, Toure Reed has a great his first book. Uh, on this is all about the changing of the guard among African-American civil rights organizations beginning in the mid to late 1920s. And there's a younger cohort that's more uh, labor oriented than right. the older cohort. Uh, and, the, and these are going to be some of the people who really spearhead what we think of as the kind of um, New Deal civil rights right. coalition. Right. Not arms with opportunity. His book on the Urban League. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. He says hello, by the way. <laughs> great show great book one of my favorites because He's, i love any book that exposes the duplicity of the black political class as you probably know Corey. yes we well are. and and you know I, I wouldn't put it exactly that way but what i also love about that book is it has so much historical resonance um in terms of generation the, the sort of generational struggle um within the african-american community and um and again i i feel like that whole it resonated a lot with me during the later part of, you know, after the, the Clinton campaign um, and just the rise of younger uh, voters um, who were willing to kind of really take on a kind of more, um, you know, more conservative, older generational class. Um, don't don't be that impressed with those Negroes, Corey, because they were reacting to the black communists and socialists who were raising hell. That's the only reason why they incorporated those more progressive policies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I hate this cliche, but it's true. Both and, you know, uh, that's it's, you know, what we do here. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we, we give those slacks to black liberals or black conservatives 
on this is revolution. No, they yeah, no, no. And it's, it's not even that. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating to watch, you know, as he reconstructs this story about, um, how this, how this is all working out in real time. Um, well, you know, what's, for, you know, what's, this is a digression. Jason, don't penalize me here, but let me give me a, a dispensation for this digression. Okay. Quite, I want to ask you a serious question. I'm going to do just for you. How much of a, of a how much of a problem does scholarship like Torres, particularly more so than his father, that challenges the notion of the progressive nature of the vanguard black liberal elite establishment of the earlier periods of the 20th century, even up to the civil rights movement? How much does that cause a bit of disruption in the upper echelons of academia as an actual project. I'm really interested. I mean, I think it's mostly contained, to be honest with you. I mean, that's that's my impression. And when I ever, whenever I tr- bring certain things out um, from from that book or his more recent book, um, it, it comes as news to people. Um, and so I think it's, you know, the, <laughs> What makes him, his work very powerful is that he's not a polemicist. I mean, and and I and I don't I, I can sometimes be myself a polemicist, but I think particularly on this issue, he he there's just a tremendous fidelity to um, I, I don't want to say the factual record because he's interpreting a factual record. It's not just facts, but it's very it's extraordinarily grounded in an, an archival uh, record that is hard to um, to reckon with. And it's and it's a framework that is um, is just frowned upon today. Um, it's just it, it's not accepted, and it goes against the currents of an ideology. And the way a lot of ideologies work is not necessarily by shutting things down, but you know they just hive it off onto the side. And I think that's the way I would describe. This, this is incredible. This is, shout out to you, Corey. Shout out to Reed. Shout out to the Reed tradition. I'll let me tell you what I'm it's so important for me to actually hear from a respected seasoned academic that scholarship, legitimately high quality scholarship that shows the old line of black political class as basically being products of their own class initiatives and not serving the best interests of the majority of black people is a distasteful concept in academia. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a, we're at a weird moment, you know, academia will sit there and talk about intersectionality and, and, Mm -hmm. and all these kinds of buzzwords. But when it comes down to seeing real cleavages within a, uh, a community, particularly a community that suffered oppression, and, and I have to say, I don't think the way people view African Americans are, is all that distinct. I mean, I see this in the way people talk about Jewish history all the time. Um, and I say, cause I'm Jewish and um, you know, the, the, the scholars within the Jewish community who have talked about class divides within the Jewish community uh, when, when, when the Jewish community was more oppressed, you know, it, nobody wants to hear that kind of stuff. So uh, there's a tendency to romanticize uh, oppressed communities. There's a, per, you know, there's always a tendency to homogenize um, and 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 this is something you know I think that's I think to get back to the topic that we're you know dealing with on the right is a real problem mm-hmm. because the right understands and has always understood again going back to the French Revolution for instance the peasants the right understood that the peasants aren't just peasants in France they're also Catholic um, they have multiple affiliations um, and if you can you know tug on different affiliations and different fractures within a community, quote unquote, um, you can pull them over to your side. Um, and, and the problem with a lot of you know, progressive scholarship is, is that it just doesn't see that kind of thing very often, or if it sees it, it doesn't really quite take it in. Um, we did want to get into, you have an article that you wrote in Politico um, a while back. Uh, Before I even get into that article, I do want to read another quote from your book. Conservatism, then, is not a commitment to limited government and liberty or a weariness of change, 
a belief in evolutionary reform or a politics of virtue. These may be byproducts of conservatism, one or more of its historically specific and ever-changing modes of expression. So you see these as just byproducts of conservatism and not conservatism uh, at large. Yeah, you know, this, I, 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 there's certain things I regret writing, not because I was wrong, not because I think they were wrong, but because I feel like people seize upon them. And sometimes uh, your, your allies and friends are more um, of a problem than your enemies. Um, because I think what the left has taken that quote to mean and similar is that somehow or another conservatism is just this raw defense of power. And that it's completely opportunistic in the in the in the in the in the stupidest sense of that word, uh, and that it'll just pick up any argument that's on hand in order to defend power without power, quote unquote, as if what power is is obvious to people and so forth. And I don't I don't that's not the meaning of that quote. The meaning of the quote is is that conservatism is a pro, is a defense of social of, of specific kinds of social domination. What those forms are will change over time, okay? And that in the course of defending those forms of social domination, conservatism will come up, is, is improvisational and is, is, is very inventive and will come up with new arguments that don't look very much like the older arguments that it used to defend. So the point of the book is to try to see both the theme, the ongoing theme and the improvisation that happens over the time and that you can't understand one without the other. And I, I, the left wants, doesn't even think of it as a theme. They think of it as a kind of reflex of power that's unintellectualized, is untheorized, is just, uh, you know, raw and immediate. And that's just not the way it works. As I said earlier, it takes the, the right years, yeah. sometimes decades to figure out the arguments it's going to use and that will work. And then once it's figured out those arguments, it's beholden to them for some period of time until they no longer work. And then it has to come up with new ones. So Corey, I, I'm, I'm glad we're coming here because let's move beyond uh, Obama to the rise of Trump. Now, <clears throat> this, is my, this might get contentious and I, I think we're friendly enough that I can. You posit some really interesting theories in your book that basically Trump was a very weak conservative president, that he didn't get his agenda effectively done, and that Trump and Trumpism is a weak phenomenon. Corey, I told you I have a lot of respect for you, but I want to just list some things. Trump gave the Republicans a majority in the Supreme Court that they haven't seen in years with hardcore reactionaries. Trump got a massive corporate tax cut. We've had three presidents of regressive tax cuts in a row, and he was the third, right? I read the piece where you're talking about how Trump was kind of vacillating on China. I would argue that Trump actually reignites a Cold War, at least in atmospherics with China, regardless of him as his one China policy. Uh, uh, I would say that even though I don't think it was a success, Trump's attempt to weaponize trade to punish the Chinese definitely starts a rhetor rhetorical anti-China policy that I think Biden has continued, quite honestly. Um, I think that Trump's scuttling of the Iran, the Iran nuclear deal definitely was a success as well. Now, that's just his presidency. I would say that Trumpism, the phenomenon of Trumpism, where you have 25 to 30 states literally right now enacting anti-CRT, which basically means anti-Black history laws, voter suppression laws. And don't forget to add in this, uh, in this hearing for this uh, potential Supreme Court uh, justice, they're bringing up CRT laws and yeah, the reading yeah. of uh, anti-racist baby, which we have. We have. Th I mean, listen, you and I are close in age. We have literally anti-abortion laws in states that were unheard of in the last 50 years in Texas. Now, if you literally go to an abortion doctor, you can be sued. Anti-trans laws. 
in the face of that, Professor Corey Robert, how can you make the <laughs> argument that the contemporary manifestation of the reactionary right is weak and ineffective and also realizing yeah. that globally the reactionary right and the neoliberal uh, global order are the only dialectic that we still have and the left isn't even relevant. Okay. I don't think you said ineffective. Do you say ineffective or did you say weak? I said ineffective and weak. So it's a, it's fine. We don't have to get caught up in the adjectives. Let's let me I'll, I'll give you my account of the record and, and okay. how it and how it differs. Here it comes. Um, so I think the first thing to look at is something that um, people on the left aren't usually that interested in, and that's budgets. Um, budgets. Uh, you know, um, Joseph Schumpeter, the economist, once said, you know, the the the, the nations. Uh, the nation, the sort of the anatomy, you, you find that the, 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 the essence of the nation is written in its, its, its fiscal history. That is the thunder of world history is the budget. And if you look at Trump's budgets, what's interesting about them, um, and we have to remember those first two years, right, when the Republicans had total control over both houses of Congress and, and the White House, is that they were Obama budgets. And when I say Obama budgets, I don't mean um, that, you know, liberal, but they were not conservative budgets. Trump had wanted, uh, with Paul Ryan, to cut a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things, including the really kind of culture war, uh, red meat kind of stuff, you know, Planned Parenthood, uh, the Health and Human Services, the National Endowment of the Humanities, National Endowment of other, all these kind of liberally kind of things that on the one hand don't mean very much, but mean a lot to the, the base. He was unsuccessful in all of those things. In fact, money was expanded and, and spending on all that. So the, if you look at social spending, it actually went up, domestic social spending, not a right-wing project. It was something that Paul Ryan tried to reverse and was unable to do. Immigration is something that of course got for rightful reasons, an awful lot of attention. Interestingly, Trump was never able to get an immigration bill through Congress at all. Um, nor was he able to get funding for his wall with this, you know, kind of epic single, you know, thing that was supposed to be so important to him. And in fact, I was looking recently at the numbers on immigration. What's interesting is just prior to the pandemic, so just prior to the pandemic, the immigration numbers under Trump were pretty much what the highest numbers had been under Obama. So in other words, you know, 70% of immigration in this country is documented. And Trump wasn't really able on the on the whole to touch that kind of stuff. Um, and then you come to the Supreme Court. And I think this is in a way, I don't wanna be too clever here, but it almost proves the point that I wanna make about the right. Um, remember we talked about the right as a reactionary project and achieving hegemony, not just over the state, not just over the party, but over the other party and the public at large. Um, that kind of hegemony has been waning. You mentioned the tax cut, Trump's ta tax cut. Ronald Reagan's tax cuts got something like 150 Democrats voting for it. George W. Bush's got something like 50 Democrats. Trump got not a single Democrat to vote for his tax cuts. It was by the skin of their teeth. It was a purely Republican thing. And it was the one thing around which the Republicans could unite that and then the courts. I see the, 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 the Republicans focus on the courts as not a sign of strength, but as a desperate scramble to lock in judges, um, knowing that this project is coming undone. Uh, you, you'll, you may remember John Adams, the famous midnight judges, these were all the judges that he appointed the Adams administration just before Thomas Jefferson took over and they thought it was going to bring in this revolution. Um, judicial appointees on that score, it was why was why was Mitch McConnell so maniacally focused on this? It's because they do understand that they are losing control over the legislative process, that even when they have full power, full power over all the elected branches of government. They are unable, with the exception of the tax cuts, to get their agenda through. And so what do you do? You start relying upon these counter-majoritarian institutions like the courts. Likewise, 
this whole business with the electoral college, you know, in a way we, 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 this is where we sort of overlook the novelty of this, that we've had two Republican, the last two Republican presidents who had to be elected, not with the popular vote, but with the electoral vote, something that hadn't happened since the end of the 19th century. That is not the sign. That is not the sign of a movement in its ascendancy. That is a sign of a movement that is holding on to whatever levers that it can. It doesn't mean that it can't do damage. That's not my thesis at all. But it does mean that its political capacity to kind of organize and lock down the, the broader discourse and what legislatively is on the table is significantly um, hampered now in comparison, in comparison to Ronald Reagan or Judge George W. Bush. And that's, those are my comparative points. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, this is not to say that the Republicans get nothing done. That's, you know, that would be an absurd claim to make, obviously. But compared to the transformative effects in terms of organizing the national discourse, changing the basic commitments of the state, um, there is really, I don't think, any comparison. Um, I mean, do you feel, with, it's interesting that we're talking about things like immigration because a lot of these immigration laws um, and the changes in immigration to make it even more draconian really starts under Clinton. Um, a lot of the prisons are filled uh, under Obama, but built under a Bush the second. Right. And by the time Trump comes around, don't you feel, and this question is to the panel, don't you feel that ultimately um, these laws are so set in stone that all Trump is talking about at this point is just bluster? I don't, I don't, I don't, I live I, near I, the wall. Like I live yeah. in Mexico and I, <laughs> and I have to see it. I, you know, I really disagree with that. I mean, I, 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 I understand that position and I hear it a lot, but I, I feel like it's too um, fluid a position because it basically, if the Trumpists get what they want, then we say, aha, you see, this is what they wanted and how powerful they are. And if they don't get it, we say, well, they didn't really want it anyway. It's just a kind of, you know, a lot of noise. The truth is they fought tooth and nail for this kind of stuff. Trump was furious. Um, and, and it caused huge rifts within, I mean, the fact that, I mean, when I was growing up, um, I understood the Republican party as kind of this lockstep party that when it had their, whenever it had power, it exercised it. That was always the myth. And, and of course the Democrats were the feckless ones who had power and just somehow like frittered it away with You know, this has always been the stereotype. Mm -hmm. And I understand that that's, uh, you know, that point of view. And as a leftist, I, I love to knock on the Democrats, when, you know, when that happens. But the truth of the matter is, is that they've held together far more than the Republicans did under Trump. I mean, it's just it's sort of a sad fact, but it's true. Um, and and and, you know, we forget all those defeats. I mean, I just want one final defeat. And again, it's a, it's um, it's it's kind of wonky, but it's hugely important. So. Um, all presidents, pretty much back to Jimmy Carter, have vetoed the national, at one point or another, have vetoed what Congress passed in terms of the military budget for one reason or another. And every time it's happened, Congress has had to back down and accommodate you know, Jimmy Carter, all of them. The one time that Congress not only um, refused to go along with what a president did, the president vetoed it, and then Congress overrode the veto was under Trump. Uh, and that was his own party repudiating him on a whole bunch of stuff, not just, you know, uh, not because he was being sort of pseudo liberal in his military budget at all. No, <laughs> um, it was a lot of other stuff like, remember, Confederate flags on military bases. He wanted to keep them. The Republican Party, oddly enough, said, no, they got to go. So anyway, you know, there's just there's too many of these kinds of things where he gets put where he and the Trumpist flank gets pushed back. For me to say that somehow, uh, you know, this is a kind of uh, right wing revenge and, you know, triumphant, um, because compared to what I saw under George W. Bush and Ronald Reagan, um, he has been significantly stymied, I would argue. But is that because <clears throat> he's a bit of an aberration, uh, a bit of an embarrassment 
uh, on the party, uh, just for the fact that you do have a bit of a rise. So there's one thing that when people talk about the, these ab- abortion and trans laws that I think always gets lost when we talk about these is we only talk about the ones that make the news. And they're usually in states where you have really reactionary state governments like Texas. Right. Right. But these laws have been in place for some time in other places like Alabama, where we saw a few years back a woman actually got shot and she was then convicted of uh, attempted murder. And there's there's numerous cases, even in, I believe, Michigan, where a woman uh, got in a car accident while pregnant and and uh, and got convicted so or got uh, uh, arrested. So these these laws have been in there's been chipping away at this for some time because of the wording of the law in general. Mm-hmm. And I think we're missing something um, when we talk about that. And Pascal, you are a lawyer and I'm sure you understand uh, Roe v. Wade better than I. No, I mean, listen, I'm not denying that this is part of a long process. Right. And I would also agree that most of the worst part of the dirty work was done from Reagan to Bush, Bush the second. But what I will also say is that what makes the dirty work worse is that the Democratic Party is been is been in on the party. Of course. Yeah. yeah. There's there's I no mean, doubt. Let's, let's, let's make this clear. The yeah. only reason why Social Security is not cut under the Obama administration is because of the Republicans. Not the Democrats. That's a fact. A lot of people don't know that. Right. So, you know, I, I, I and so what, this is what I always come back to is, is that in order to demonstrate the weakness of a force, you have to have a counter force. Right. And so in some ways, these arguments are a little bit hypothetical, so long as there's not a significant, powerful group on the left that's able to do what I think has never been has has not been in the grasp of the left in a very long time, but should be, which is toppling this tottering regime of, of the right. And I think you're dead on that the problem here then comes back to the Democratic Party. Um, it is not a party that you know it's a divided party, um, but you know it's it's sort of dominant um, uh, tendencies don't really want to um, gut this regime. And that's that's the problem. Um, and that's where we are. And so to me, that doesn't seem to be a sign of the power of the right. It's really of the weakness of the left. And this is, you know, I, I've been writing about the right for a very long time. And and I didn't really talk about the left so you know that much until the last couple of years because it has increasingly become apparent to me, something that I think was apparent to a lot of other people before, but it took me some time. That the real problem, um, when I and when I say problem, I want to be very clear what I mean here. The reason why we're not able to get political traction is not because the right is so hegemonic and powerful. Far from it. It's simply because we just don't have a left that has the kind of organizational capacity, political will, um, and institutional positioning uh, ready to like you know defeat it. And so that's where we come back to, I think. Well, I want to address that because I, my, my question slash answer is going to go back in time. I make the argument that, first of all, there, there are leftists and liberals. Leftists are a coalition of people who basically largely come about after the rise of Bernie Sanders. And the ones before that are usually holdovers from the new left of the 60s. Basically, there are people who challenge capitalism, racism, imperialism, sexism, homophobia, Generally, left. Some would, some are Marxists, some are not. We all know what left. You know, this is a left show. We know what the left leftists are. Pretty much before Sanders, leftists were beyond irrelevant. They were basically people that you could fit in a large high school gymnasium for the majority of the 50 plus year counter revolution, maybe after 1975. Sanders come along, comes along, and we have a whole new generation of quote unquote leftists. Sadly. They're just bigger in number and still irrelevant. What we're talking about right now are liberals. And this is why I disagree with you and the point you just made. I don't believe that liberals are failing because they're weak. I believe that liberals are doing exactly what they want to do because since the rise of the Democratic Leadership Conference in the 80s, the goal of the Democratic Party 
has been to make the argument telegraphed to finance capital and the military industrial complex that they are the more effective stewards of the machines of reaction than the Republicans. And the reason why they are coalescing with the Republicans is not because they're soft or it's an ideological project. That is the goal of their project, because they want to be the party of the ruling class. Yeah. And the ruling class is a reactionary class. I think this, the, what you're characterizing was certainly true of Bill Clinton and certainly true of Barack Obama. Um, and when I say though, I don't just mean them as individuals, I mean the whole formation around them. This was, in particular, Clinton, I think, had a very clear and coherent narrative and story about all of these issues that you're talking about that fit very, very well together. Obama, I think, was a little bit more in incoherent, not because he wasn't smart or anything like that, but because I think there were some problems with that story that he couldn't quite work out and nobody has. Um, so I think that's true. I think, however, in the same way that the Republican, the, the, the right that I'm talking about is becoming unraveled, I think the liberals that you're talking about are also becoming unraveled. I don't think they are as coherent in the way that you're describing. And that, well, let me put it this way. I think the DLC and Clintonism, all the things that you're describing, they could narrate in you know 12 steps with with you know quite a bit of specificity i don't think those steps are that clear anymore and i think this is why you start having these experiments like the spending under the last year of trump and the first stimulus package under biden that started opening up things in ways that no a lot of them didn't quite anticipate um you know the, the unemployment spending under trump that, that last year um, my wife was unemployed, so you know I have a very visceral sense of this. I mean, it was unprecedented the amount of money that they were pumping in. That that's, that wasn't part of the neoliberal um, austerity plan. I'm not saying it's a break with capitalism. That's not my point. It's just that what the the tools for defending capitalism I don't think are as clear right now as they were as recently as um, in 2008 to 2000. And, I think that's because the crisis has yeah. intensified. Absolutely. And the contradictions yeah. have intensified. And the political expression of those contradictions as well. So, and here we come to what you were saying about liberalism. You know, liberalism is a kind of complicated animal. And I probably um, see it with slight more sympathy than you do. Um, but if we could take that normative issue aside the truth is is that liberalism can go in multiple directions um i've just been reading intensively about the new deal and the 1930s and the 1940s and under pressure from the kinds of things you're talking about communists trade unionists african-american uh, northern urban activists um southern organizers uh liberalism really started getting pushed very far it still claimed to be liberalism um but it can be pushed. And I think right now we're just seeing a, a kind of unraveling. And I think the possibilities are there. This is why I think sometimes I'm a little bit more hopeful than a lot of people on the left, just because I see the the, the kind of stranglehold coming undone uh, in a way that I think is all to the good. You know, you brought up the Supreme Court. Um, the left or liberals um, uh, have you know held on to that the holy grail of the Supreme Court for far too long. And the fact that I think that's coming under question is all to the good. You know, the fact that you have, I don't know how many votes now in the Senate w w willing to get rid of the filibuster is all like, these are things that 10 years ago, I would have never imagined. And sure, they seem like institutional small bore things, but in those institutional fights, you sometimes get social, um, cataclysms coming out of them. Uh, oh. And so I'm much, much more hopeful than I have been in a very long time because all of the, the assumptions that were so hegemonic when I was growing up and came of age are, I think, being challenged and coming under under question. Corey, I want to address this and we're going to we're coming to the end of the show, but I know why you're optimistic. I'm going to call you out. 
Corey is one year older than I am, and I know why he's optimistic. We remember how crap the politics of this country was for the majority of our lives when no one gave a damn about socialism. No one gave a damn about anything. I mean, a lot of my work is about, you know, the 80s and 90s and the lack of uh, of politics. Um, I will say, I believe in FDR's letters to his brother, I forget who he wrote a letter to, where he admits that uh, his greatest achievement was saving capitalism. And we have to also remember that FDR was an elite. So. Yeah, but Corey, uh, I think you should don't don't get too uh, sanguine with that hope just because you're seeing a bunch of 30 year olds on Twitter with hammer and sickles in there uh, and roses. <laughs> in your Believe me, that's not. He's in I'll Brooklyn, tell, I'll, dude. I'll, He's I'll, all about it. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I think was the most hopeful thing of the last however many years. It was those teacher strikes yes. in red states, mm-hmm. in red yeah. states that were successful. That to me is, um, again, something nobody would have ever predicted. Um, speaking a language that was, you know, all but foreign in those states on a topic, you know, teachers, the, one of the most reviled groups in this country, public school teachers, able to push that agenda. Uh, in West Virginia and Oklahoma, places like that, um, you know, that's that's impressive. So that's where I it's I, well, yes. we Twitter. Twitter, yeah. Twitter is where hope goes to die. So, <laughs> Corey, you are joining us for the champagne room. You're going to click that other link. And we're going to talk. I, a little bit. I have to just get some water. Speaking of. Oh, champagne. that's no, we set up, we've got to set up what we're talking about. Corey, we got a friend of the show here, Shirley, who shot a major missive of you. I know you got you got the cojones to address it. He said she thinks that your optimism is rooted in you being white. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry. Hey, don't answer that now. Save that answer for. Corey yeah. Robin is going to tell us why he thinks Clarence Thomas's jurisprudence is tied to him being a black nationalist. <laughs> So thank you guys, Corey. Thank you so much for coming on thank and you. hanging out Corey, with us. Listen, you know I appreciate you took all the bullets, man. You you got the Batman shield, the super vet. We came hard at. I came hard at you because I knew you could take it, and you you handled it well. And uh, I'm glad. I hope you will be willing to come back again at another time. I do. I teach Brooklyn College students. I I got to be honest with you. This is sort of you know par for the courses. <laughs> We speak. Uh, it's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's not such a um, polite world. So. Do you feel like welcome back, Cotter, when you walk in the class? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. We used to. Um, my office mate and I used to say, you know, we're just going to get old in these broken down buildings, and it's going to be like welcome back, Cotter. And now I'm probably older. Than he was in that show, so it's it's even yeah. That was the seventies show, so he was probably like twenty eight, and he looked forty seven. I know. And I hope you're not inhaling too much asbestos. So Corey, thank you very much <laughs> for hanging out with us, Pascal. Yes, yes. Are you yeah. ready for I'm the ready. champagne? Corey, you have the link to the champagne room. We will see you there. Okay, I'm just gonna go get some water, and I'll be right yeah. back. Right. Thank you guys oh so much. We will see you Thursday for the This Is Revolution News Roundup, and we are what, tomorrow is the mama. Mom.